and welcome to Motor Week. On today's programme, Ginny Buckley takes up speed golf with the latest fast hatch from VW. Eliza Portelli finds out what's new at the Škoda factory. Chris Goffey tests the Bora against the Octavia. And I use, well, any old excuse really, just to drive Audi's Quattro. Since it first appeared on our shores back in the late 70s, VW's Golf GTI has won a firm place in many a heart. It's a fantastic all-round motor. It looks the part, you know it's going to last, it's practical, but above all, it's always been fantastic fun to drive. The Mark 1 Golf GTI was closely based on the standard Golf. An excellent, if slightly boring car, but an uprated suspension, a 1.6 litre fuel-injected engine and sports trim turned it into a pocket rocket. During its lifetime, the Mark 1 changed very little, apart from the addition of a 1.8 engine that was carried over to the Mark 2. Now, this model had got a little bit chunky around the midriff, but hey, don't we all as the years go by? But apart from that, all the important bits that made the Golf GTI so popular were retained. the Mark II does show its age a little bit. There's no power steering, of course you don't get ABS as standard, and believe me, the ride is extremely harsh compared to modern cars. But despite all of that, it is fantastic fun to drive. But because of its age, it means that there are some positive points. The engine hasn't been strangled by that catalytic converter. The steering feels very direct, you get plenty of feedback and you know exactly what the tyres are up to. And the harsh ride does make you feel like you're going very fast indeed. This is the perfect car if you're young and you don't mind roughing it just a little bit. That's you, then you will have an absolute ball. Unfortunately, all good things have to come to an end, so we waved goodbye to Mark II and we said hello to a rather different Mark III version. This time around, it seems those Volkswagen engineers have gone all middle-aged. You may get an extra rotund body with the Mark III version and you get more refinement and room inside, but at what cost? Well, you feel it in the handling. There's a two litre engine in this version and it's got the same brake as the Mark II, but you really don't feel it. You've got to work it and keep the revs right up high to get the most out of the power. But having said that, in this version, you get a good all round car and you are getting the GTI badge for not much extra cost. Then there were four, or should that be five? Because alongside the conventional Mark IV GTI, there's now, heaven forbid, a diesel version as well. know that diesels and the GTI legend should really be kept apart, but give this car a bit of a chance. In terms of ride and handling, it feels no different to the Mark IV petrol GTI. But where the engine's concerned, it's a completely different ball game. For a start, there's an awful lot more torque and it comes in much lower down the engine range. Now in many modern cars, you really have to work the engine. You've got to get the revs up high, drop down the gears to get any power out of it. That's not the case with the TDI. You get an instant power surge just when you need it. And out of corners, there's very little that can keep up with it. Believe me, it's fantastic fun. Okay, I've got to admit, there is a bit of rattle and roll when you first start up. And at low speeds, it does sound a teeny bit like a bus. 
but let's get on to the subject of economy. This car will get you from A to B as fast as a petrol GTI version, but believe me, it will cost you an awful lot less. The new Golf GT TDI PB has 115 brake horsepower, an increased load and torque, a six-speed gearbox and all the sports trim you'd expect on a GTI. And it's all very impressive. VW's Golf GTI is a perfect example of evolution. But which version is the best? Well, that's an impossible question to answer because each of them offers something very different. If I was 19 again, well, I'd want the hard ride and the excitement of the Mark II version but I'm not, and these days I like my creature comforts. And for that reason, I'm surprising even myself, because I'd have to plump for that very talky diesel. Join me, if you will, on a trip back in time, a trip back before the Subaru Impreza, before the Mitsubishi Evolution Series, before the BMW M3, before, in other words, the true sports saloon. To a time when the hottest point-to-point -point cars were the Lotus Sunbeam and the very early Golf GTIs. And then imagine meeting this for the very first time. It must have been good. The body shape didn't change, not even an inch, right from the very beginning to the end of production in 1991. This is a 1988 version, resplendent in this pearlescent white paint that was an optional extra, and it cost a thousand pounds, even back then in the 1980s. With a little over 200 bhp available, there's no shortage of power, but it's how it puts it down that makes the Quattro really special. And this, the S4, is one of the very latest to wear the Quattro badge. Sure, things have moved on a bit. It's now got over 260 brake horsepower lurking under that bonnet. But then it is up against some pretty stiff competition nowadays compared to anything that was around in the 1980s. Wow, and straight away, what a difference a decade or two makes, whereas the old Quattro just screams its performance potential at you. With today's S4, you've really got to actually start to explore it before you discover just how much this car really is capable of. anything like the raw brutality of the Quattro of the 80s, but then it can't afford to. We're more demanding today. We expect a better compromise between sophistication and performance. This, the S4 Quattro, is the latest and I suspect the beginning of yet another line of Quattros. At £37,000, it is undeniably a true performance bargain. Join us after the break when Chris Goffey drives the VW Bora and the Skoda Octavia.
Most people in Britain may think that Skoda started making cars after World War II in the communist era. Some of you may even be aware that investment by Volkswagen has led to a product revolution for the Czech company. Well, I've come all the way to the Czech Republic to tell you a story that you may not have heard. Here in the Skoda Museum, the company has gathered some of the cars which built an impressive pre-war reputation. In fact, the company started building cars around 1905 as a second product for the Lauren and Clement Bicycle Company, quite similar to the way that Peugeot started out. This 1906 model is certainly not cheap and nasty. Back then in the days of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, these were at the forefront of automotive design. to 1911 and not only are the lines sleek but the craftsmanship is wonderful. We've now moved up to the 1930s with this Skoda Tudor. Again there's nothing cheap and nasty about this little coupe apart from personally I don't really like the colour but the biggest surprise is yet to come. Just take a look at this, the Felicia. Now the year is 1959, the Cold War was going on between the US and Russia. The Mini was launched this year, but Skoda came up with this beautiful roadster. Oh, take me back to 1959 any day. 1971 saw this prototype saloon. Unfortunately, it never made production. And let's not forget, the British came up with the Morris Marina in this year. Now I think Batman would have loved this car. In 1971 they created the Super Sport Ferrat and I think that this is probably the nearest that Skoda got to a supercar. In fact I should be very honoured because I'm standing next to one of the Czech Republic's film stars because this car starred in the movie Vampire from Ferrat and rumour has it it runs on blood. <laughs> This is a 1975 prototype. We had the Mini Moog and they would have had this, but unfortunately it didn't go into production. So I guess that the flower power had reached the Czech Republic a little too late. Nowadays, of course, the cars bear the hallmark of Volkswagen. Production takes place in modern factories and the quality is once again up there with the best of the West. The past nine years have seen Skoda grow in stature as a world automotive supplier. Production has more than doubled from 172,000 in 1991 to over 371,000 in 1999 and this sets to increase with new models on the way. And here's another twist. Far from leaving the customer contact merely to the dealers who sell you the car, here on the continent you have the option of collecting your car straight from the factory. Let's get this straight. Ferrari, Aston Martin, TVR, these are companies you'd expect to have that personal contact. Perhaps next time when you think of Skoda as the maker of cheap communist cars, transformed by the backing of the mighty Volkswagen Group, then think again and bear in mind what you've seen here. The communist era was a hiccup and Skoda are back where they were in the good old days, making great cars. A glamorous location for the launch of an important car. In fact, Japan's best-selling car for three years running. It's the Suzuki Wagon R. Or shouldn't that be the Wagon R? Well, no. This is the new version. It has been thoroughly revised. So gone are those rather quirky Japanese boxy looks that really were lost in the translation. And we get this, a rounded, more European version. It's really rather cute. More, in fact, of a Wagon R.
Thanks to the really surprisingly lofty driving position and a quite surprisingly high standard of fit and finish in here, it feels a lot more substantial than you might expect from first looking at it. And all that acreage of window and glass might make it look like something more suitable for growing tomatoes, but actually means there's no shortage of visibility to peer around you. Unfortunately, it also means you can be seen rather easily. Despite its tall and narrow appearance, the drive is not all rock and roll. It's really quite comfortable. The gearbox is precise and accurate, the engine willing, and the handling quite rewarding. This is crazy. I'm driving around Monte Carlo, one of the glamour capitals of the world. In this, there's people out there in Ferraris. It's embarrassing. Back of the wagon. Oh. It's the result of collaboration between Suzuki and GM, with the Vauxhall version being badged a Gila. The European influence is clear to see. Some of the wackier elements of the design have gone, and that includes the ridiculous towel rail boot handle, now replaced with a far more sensible item. Because we see so few of them in the UK, it's easy to forget just how popular the Suzuki Wagon R is on a worldwide scale. In actual fact, they've sold over one and a half million of them. And that's a lot of our soul. It may be small, but it's strong. Both safety and security have been enhanced. There's now an immobiliser and double door locks, so there's no danger of getting your arse swiped. It's not without its faults, though. Whilst the rear headroom was designed around the giraffe, I think the rear legroom is aimed more at the gerbil. Wagon, ah. However, if you can forget its links with its lunatic predecessor, then I think the new look is genuinely quite appealing, which will make Suzuki doubly pleased because they've announced that last year they smashed through the magical 1% share barrier when it comes to market sales in the UK. Wagon hurrah! Anyway, my boat's waiting, so uh, wagon tara. It's a simple idea. Design yourself a common floor pan and then base lots of different models on that floor pan and you save yourself loads of money. Well, that's what the Volkswagen Group have done. They developed a chassis and powertrain which is underneath the new Golf, the Audi A3, this, the new Volkswagen Bora and the Skoda Octavia. But just how different in character and performance and appeal can two cars be when they share the same underpinnings? Let's find out. Our protagonists in this lineup are the top of the Bora range, the V5, a smooth 150 brake horsepower Executive Express, and what Skoda called the top of their range, the Octavia, but fitted with the 1.8 litre turbocharged petrol engine. It's an interesting comparison because both engines develop the same maximum power. 150 brake horsepower in both cases, but it's the way the engines deliver that performance that makes them rather different. As a car manufacturer, it's very difficult to shed an image once it's become established in the buyer's minds. Now take this car. I turned up the other day and somebody said, what are you driving? I said, I'm driving a Skoda Octavia. And they smiled at me. Why did they smile? They remembered those dreadful old Jasper Carrot jokes because Skoda very definitely is no joke anymore. It's built by the Volkswagen Group to the same standards as Audi and other Volkswagen cars. You don't normally associate Skoda with the image of sportiness, but with this 1.8 turbo engine. Well, it's definitely all of that. When the turbo comes in, the car really flies. It, it's like a, a Volkswagen Golf GTI in feel. And it delivers the power in a, a very different way to the Bora. The, the V5 develops exactly the same 150 brake horsepower, but it's a much smoother unit. It gets the feeling of the, uh, the iron fist in the velvet glove. Whereas this is out and out, rorty torty wheel spinning performance. fascinating to see how two design teams tackle the job of engineering the body shells of these two cars. Volkswagen engineers took rather a different uh, line at the top of the doors. Skoda have come down, you'll see, 
and Skoda has gone for a much more steeply sloping rear window and a hatchback. Gives you a huge space inside the boot, but uh, Bora has similar dimensions, but a very narrow boot lid, so it's actually quite difficult to get into. I think of the two, I prefer the hatchback. This is the top of the range car, and it comes with these rather good alloy wheels and leather upholstery as standard, 17,299 pounds. Not cheap, but uh, perhaps more effective is the bottom of the range entry level model, which is just 11,299, and you get most of this. So how does Volkswagen tackle the same chassis? Lighter and airier in the Bora, thanks to the choice of light coloured materials on door trims and carpets and headlining but that's obviously a matter of uh, specification of choosing the colours you want inside the car. Nice little touches like the fake wood trim on the doors on the face here and the gear knob add to the image of a, an executive express. Ride and handling feel very much the same if anything the Bora feels slightly softer I don't know if they've got um, softer spring rates in here than they have in the Skoda, but slightly more float to the car than the Octavia. There's really not a lot to choose between the two cars, and that's a compliment to Skoda, evinced by their huge success in the European and UK market since the Volkswagen takeover. Volkswagen dealers tell us that the Bora isn't exactly setting the world on fire from a sales point of view. And no big surprise there either, because its predecessors, the Jetta and the Vento, were always sold far less than the hatchback Golf. Really, the choice between the two comes down to which engines do you want, which interior trim, and what extras you're going to specify. But whichever way you build your car, the Skoda's going to save you at least a thousand pounds, if not a lot more. And that's the most compelling argument of all. Join us next week on Motor Week when Ginny Buckley drives the latest Toyota Yaris and Ken Gibson checks out the new Toyota MR2.